Designed in 1974 and still going strong, the EMU is the spacesuit that astronauts continue to use on the International Space Station. Gemini was the brief but intense interim program where NASA pioneered rendezvous maneuvers needed for lunar missions. In 1963, Project Mercury had come as far as the technology would allow. The final three missions were cancelled so that NASA could shift focus to a new program and develop the techniques needed to reach the moon. It was decided that before embarking on the three-man Apollo program, as had been intended, an intermediate stage to learn about orbital rendezvous and docking was needed. It was in Houston that Mr. Kennedy emphasized the need for peaceful uses. It was called Project Gemini, and in many ways, the new program's capsule was more advanced than the Apollo spacecraft that would follow it. It was designed for a two-man crew, and astronauts referred to it as the Gusmobile because Mercury veteran Gus Grissom had played a major role in its development. The Gemini spacecraft would have the ability to change its orbit, and it included instrumentation and systems that were borrowed from jet fighters. One of its most revolutionary features was its onboard computer. It had a memory of just 20 kilobytes. At the beginning, it was proposed that the Gemini capsule wouldn't have landing parachutes, but a regalo wing. Grissom was involved in the early tests before this idea was abandoned. It added a layer of complexity that couldn't be easily accommodated in the capsule's design, and NASA reverted to the traditional water landing. To boost the Gemini spacecraft to orbit, NASA hastily adapted the US Air Force's Titan II missile. The Titan II had a much simpler design because it used hypergolic propellant which could remain stored in the rocket for long periods. The two fuel components didn't have to be kept at sub-zero temperatures, but they were extremely toxic and dangerous to handle. Designers understood that any launch mishap wouldn't cause the large explosion seen with liquid oxygen, so they dispensed with the launch escape system used in the Mercury program and equipped the Gemini capsule with ejector seats. Of the original Mercury 7 astronauts, only Grissom, Shirar and Cooper remained with the rest, having left NASA or having been suspended for medical reasons. To bolster its core of space pilots, NASA took in a second group of nine astronauts in 1962 and another 14 the following year. Before the astronauts could fly, the Gemini-Titan combination had to be tested to demonstrate its reliability. The booster was prone to rapid variations in thrust, known as pogo oscillations. Modifications were made to the rocket and unmanned flights of Gemini 1 and 2 were made in 1964 and 1965. Mercury veteran Gus Grissom and new recruit John Young would fly the first manned Gemini mission. Because the Gemini craft was fitted with ejector seats, they had special training exercises that involved parachuting into the water. The two astronauts also spent long hours in the Gemini simulator, where engineers could run them through challenging scenarios that may happen in space, while also training mission controllers. 
The Gemini 3 flight was scheduled for March the 23rd, 1965, and as the launch date approached, publicity became intense. The new President Lyndon Johnson was keen to be seen with the next astronauts. America was gaining confidence about its future in space. Five days before Gemini 3 was due to blast off, the Soviet Union launched a two-man spacecraft. What nobody was expecting was another record, the world's first spacewalk. Cosmonaut Alexei Leonov left his Voskhod 2 capsule to float freely in space for 12 minutes. In the West, it was perceived as another Soviet triumph. In reality, Leonov's suit had distorted and he was only just able to get back inside. The whole mission was plagued with difficulties, but these details didn't come to light for decades. For America, Gemini 3 felt like a welcome return to space. It had been almost two years since a NASA astronaut had been in orbit. It would be the first of ten manned Gemini missions. American media was making the astronauts household names. Achievements of the new maneuverable craft in space included the first change in orbital shape and the first change in orbital plane. After just three orbits, Grissom and Young returned to Earth. During the Mercury program, astronauts had named their capsules. Grissom had named Gemini 3 Molly Brown, after the Broadway show The Unsinkable Molly Brown. NASA did not like this, as it was a reference to Grissom's Mercury capsule that had sunk to the bottom of the ocean. Barely three days after their return to Earth, Grissom and Young were at the White House where President Johnson presented them with NASA's Distinguished Service Medal. Then, something that was to become common across the Gemini missions, a ticker tape parade through the streets of New York. NASA understood that the American public needed something in return for the hugely expensive space program it gave them a new brand of hero. The next mission, Gemini 4, would be a much longer duration flight. Its crew would be from NASA's second intake of astronauts, Ed White and Jim McDivitt. They had been in training for three years. White had been practicing with a special maneuvering unit that he would use during NASA's first spacewalk. Three, two, one, zero. Gemini 4 blasted off on the 3rd of June 1965. After the previous flight had verified the spacecraft, this mission would work out how to use it. Soon after reaching orbit, the crew located the rocket's discarded second stage and tried to move towards it using visual cues only. But the more McDivitt manoeuvred towards it, the further away the booster got. Rendezvous was going to be harder than it seemed and Mission Control called the exercise off. Okay, there was a more the important down. task. The the During the third orbit, Ed White opened the door of the depressurized capsule and using the maneuvering unit, nicknamed the zip gun, he moved into the void. This exercise had been shifted up the Gemini schedule after the success of Alexei Leonov's spacewalk. Soon a stray glove drifted from the capsule. It would continue in orbit for another month before burning up in the Earth's atmosphere. The spacewalk was successful, except for a small break in communications. The flight director says get back in. Jim, what's going 
Got any message for us? Chimney 4, get back in. Okay. I don't know, we're coming over to the west, the west end. They want you to come back in now. Roger, we've been trying to talk to you for a while here. Another first for Gemini 4 was that the control centre had moved from Cape Canaveral to a new home in Houston. And because the mission was due to last four days, it was the first time that three separate eight-hour shifts had gone into operation. There had been a problem with the computer and the hatch had been difficult to open and close, but as Gemini 4 re-entered the Earth's atmosphere, mission control regarded the flight as a success. But they now knew future missions would have to focus on orbital rendezvous. Post-flight honours for White and McDivitt included a ceremony at the University of Michigan, where they had both studied. At another ceremony, the President pinned NASA's Exceptional Service Medals on them. The Gemini program was just starting to deliver but America was still not sure if they were catching up with the Soviet Union. But the future for Gemini seemed bright. Venus is just over 43 million kilometres away. Early astronomers believed it to be similar to Earth. In 2005, ESA launched the Venus Express mission. And after eight years of close observation, we now know a lot more about our planet's nearest neighbour. Surface temperatures on Venus are more than 450 degrees Celsius, and its atmospheric pressure is almost 100 times greater than here on Earth. You have clouds that are made up of um, sulfuric acid, in fact. So it's a very nasty place to be at. And the, that's one of the big questions on, on, on Venus. Why did Venus go that way? And why did we on the Earth go this way? The planet takes 243 Earth days to rotate on its own axis, and only 220 days to go around the sun. and its rotation is opposite to Earth's, with the sun rising in Venus's west. In Venus's upper atmosphere, violent winds blow at speeds up to 400 kilometers per hour, and it has permanent hurricanes almost 200 kilometers across, moving around its poles. Information about the climate and magnetic field has been gathered by Venus Express since it went into orbit around Venus in 2006. It has been made available to a broad cross-section of experts. As Venus Express neared the end of its operational life, its handlers began taking risks, guiding the probe closer and closer to the planet, where it could observe in greater detail. In a manoeuvre known as aerobraking, the probe edged through Venus's upper atmosphere. We are going so close that we actually sense the atmosphere as a friction against uh, the structure of the, of the spacecraft. And in that way we can measure uh, densities in the, in, the, in, the, in the atmosphere of Venus that we have not been able to measure for all those eight years we've been circling the planet. So we also measure magnetic fields with a magnetometer and we measure energetic particles that we find there. So it's a very new type of measurements and a very valuable data we're collecting these days. In the end, Venus Express exceeded its design brief to collect a new class of information about Venus. This helps us to understand the evolution of our solar system and, with Venus being very close to the size of Earth, science is gaining an insight into Earth's possible future. Since the earliest days of flights to space, each new spacecraft had a new spacesuit designed specially to go with it. The Mercury program used a version of the US Navy's Mark IV. The Gemini astronauts wore the G3C and G5C, 
which were based on the suit worn by X-15 pilots. They had to cope with possible ejection and with spacewalks. The Apollo astronauts wore versions of the A7L spacesuit. It had to be able to cope with the lunar environment and protect its wearer during what often looked like hard labour. With the development of the Space Shuttle came two new spacesuits. The ACES or pumpkin suits worn by crew during launch and landing. And for work outside in the vacuum of space, the EMU for extravehicular mobility unit. The EMU is like a mini spacecraft. It provides self-contained life support for its wearer for more than eight hours. And it was the suit in which astronauts learned in space construction techniques during the early shuttle years. The design was commissioned by NASA in 1974. And although there have been many refinements, Essentially, the same EMU is still in service on the International Space Station. It was the EMU that enabled the construction of the orbiting laboratory. The suit has 14 different layers with a range of different functions, including insulation from extremes of temperature and protection from micrometeoroids. Pressure inside the suit is about one quarter of standard atmospheric pressure. Higher suit pressures mean less mobility, but the low pressure means the astronaut must breathe pure oxygen. Nitrogen bubbles would condense in the wearer's bloodstream and body tissue if low pressure air was used. In preparation for a spacewalk, an astronaut must pre-breathe pure oxygen for several hours to purge his system of nitrogen, and this process starts before the astronaut begins getting into his suit. The upper part of the suit is a rigid shell made from fiberglass. It provides firm attachment for the life support backpack and a tool kit mounted at the chest. As part of their preparation for a sojourn on the International Space Station, mission specialists will spend long hours training in the EMU at the Neutral Buoyancy Lab in Houston. Crew members have to be prepared for unexpected maintenance tasks outside the ISS. Problems with solar panels, coolant loops and leaky plumbing have required repair spacewalks. The Russian Orland suit is also used on the ISS. It affords slightly less mobility than the EMU, but it is much quicker to put on, and its on-orbit maintenance is much simpler. The EMU was designed to be serviced on the ground, but ISS crews have had to adapt and learn how to open up the suit to locate problems and fix them. For complex repairs, ground specialists have even prepared video instructions for the ISS crew to follow. Leak problem. Every time the suit is put on, it is checked for leaks. While small losses are expected, any significant leak must be repaired immediately. Shuttle astronaut and physician Michael Barrett had to locate and replace a damaged O-ring. The failure of such a small part could threaten a whole mission. A new Z-series spacesuit is being developed, but evaluations will not be complete until at least 2020. So the familiar EMU will remain in service for a while yet. The 1970s vintage suit that built the ISS and kept the Hubble Space Telescope working deserves its big reputation. Three, two, unité, podium. Décollage, lift up. When a probe or satellite is launched, 
it can only perform its function because of a complex communications infrastructure here on Earth. A craft operating in deep space sends data via a transmitter with signal strength similar to a domestic light bulb. By the time it reaches Earth, a distance measured in millions of kilometres, this signal is incredibly weak. ESA, the European Space Agency, has three giant dishes at locations around the world so it can communicate with its array of deep space probes. Sobreros is situated in a rural area west of the Spanish capital Madrid, where electromagnetic interference is at a minimum. The 35-metre dish is capable of fine pointing accuracy. Not only does the dish have to point directly at its distant target probe, it must track with it to compensate for both the probe's movement and the Earth's rotation. The 620-ton dish must move smoothly and with an accuracy of within one kilometre at a distance of 100 million kilometres. ESA's deep space dishes have to transmit as well as receive. For this, the power of the transmitter is important. A signal strength of 20,000 watts is focused into a narrow beam by the parabolic dish. The first antenna in ESA's deep space network was built at New Norcia in southwestern Australia. It's similar in design to Sabreros, the station which picks up signals from probes as the Earth's rotation takes them out of New Norcia's line of sight. Currently, the deep space network has a heavy workload as the Rosetta probe continues to transmit its own data and relay information from the Philae lander. The final member of ESA's deep space trio is Malague in Argentina, 1,200 kilometres west of Buenos Aires. This is the system's newest antenna, having been finished less than two years ago. It completes the network's coverage of the sky in any direction at any time. The three deep space dishes are coordinated from ESOC, the European Space Operations Centre in Darmstadt, Germany. In addition to the deep space probes, ESOC is also responsible for communication with Earth orbiting satellites via a different group of smaller ground stations monitoring spacecraft in polar orbits. For more than 45 years, the centre has provided the link between Earth and a variety of research spacecraft. Currently, the network is controlling 13 different long-term missions. <laughs>